Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. Uh, the show is broadcast live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show every week as we are doing today, and it is then posted to our website for you to watch at your convenience. And I'll show you at the end of today's show uh, where you can access all of our archives. Both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone who might be interested in any of the topics we have on, on Compass Live. Uh, for those of you not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries here in Nebraska. So similar to your so-and-so state library. Um, and so we provide services to all types of libraries in the state. So you'll find uh, shows on Encompass Live for all types of libraries, uh, public, academic, K-12, corrections, museums, archives, anything and everything. Uh, really our only criteria is that it's something to do with libraries, um, something cool uh, we, libraries are doing, um, something we think they could be doing. We do book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, uh, demos of services and products, all sorts of things. Um, sometimes we have Nebraska Library Commission staff come on to talk about things that we are offering through the commission or services and events here locally in Nebraska, but we also bring in guest speakers and that is what we have from across the country. And that's what we have this morning. Um, with us today is April Griffith. Good morning, April. Good morning, Krista, and everyone out there. Yeah, and she is from the Eureka Springs Carnegie Library in um, Arkansas, and she um, is going to talk to us about saving the world with small libraries. Yay, I love that. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is a session that was done at the um, Association for Rural and Small Libraries Conference, correct? Early last year? Last year. Correct, last year. yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, and I invited her to come on to share it with even more people here. We here in Nebraska are, most of our state is rural and small libraries. Mm -hmm. um, most of them from communities, uh, population, if that, 5,000 or less, um, except for our big cities, Omaha and Lincoln. So um, definitely uh, anything to do with our small libraries, something close to my heart. <laughs> um, and they're always doing, looking to do new things. So I'm just gonna hand it over to you, April, to tell us about um, how we can do this. Perfect. Well, thank you again so much for inviting me here. I love talking about this um, and sharing these ideas with other people because I think that's sort of how we make a huge impact is by sharing this and, and sort of getting it out there. Um, and I want to say thank you to everyone who's joined us today for being here. And I guess I want to start first by telling you my story um, and how and why we started implementing sustainability at my small library. Um, so to get started, let's see if it'll let me progress to the next one. There we go. Um, so <laughs> this is gonna sound like a meandering story, but I promise I will get to the point. Um, as part of a leadership workshop um, through the, that the Arkansas State Library um, sponsored and, and people had to apply to get into, um, the, my cohort read um, Simon Sinek's book, Start With Why. If you're not familiar with it, it's a wonderful book. Um, and it's part of the task of finding out why you do, why we as librarians were doing what we are doing. We were tasked with completing um, an exercise where for finding our own whys, where we were reviewing some of our personal life stories, you know, meaningful moments in your life that helped shape um, the, the person that we had each become um, and and sort of the stories you sort of recount that are almost just like old old memories you turn over and you know by heart and they're just part of your foundation. Um, and you sort of collect these stories and then you read them and try to find what links them together to decipher what motivates you. Um, when I was doing this, I realized that a lot of my stories had to do with traveling and going on these sort of various adventures of different sizes and seeing these really awe-inspiring experiences and these amazing views and, and meeting just some really incredible people. Um, and one of my stories was from doing a semester at sea, which if you don't know about it, it's been a, a study abroad program that's been going on since the 70s. You um, 
you live aboard a cruise ship and you go to school every day, you are on board the ship, but it stops at different ports of call around the world. And when you're at those different countries, you travel and the whole curriculum, whatever classes you you can take, whatever classes they offer, but they're all centered a little bit themed around the different countries you're visiting to give you more of a global perspective. Um, let's see. So on that trip, um, I ended up going to India in the February in February of 2005. Um, and when we were there, um, I had this experience of sailing into the Bay of Bengal and seeing um, this beautiful sapphire colored water and just realizing how connected we are as um, a people on this planet and just how beautiful it was. And it was kind of like a, a huge juxtaposition when we got, um, we went to shore and I was on the beach and I, um, what I saw was the aftermath of the 2004 Boxing Day tsunami, which um, had displaced a lot of people who were now living on the beach. Um, and there was trash all over the beach um, that had blown up from the ocean, obviously. Um, that, that tsunami displaced, um, let's see, 1.7 million people. It resulted in a quarter million casualties and it was just pretty terrible. So one of the things that immediately affected me is when I got back from that trip, which changed my life, um, I switched my major to industrial design with a personal focus on designing environmentally products. But that for me personally was a dead end. Um, when I graduated, there wasn't really a market for um, green design for sustainable design. Imagine the the focus on industrial design at that time and, and some um, some areas of the profession still is on planned obsolescence, which is when you design something that is kind of designed to break. So uh, consumers will replace it with the newest version. And that really uh, was disheartening. So I took a step back after I graduated and figured out what I wanted to do. And I, I decided to pursue my MLS with the goal of being able to share information and ideas. So as a result of all these stories and collecting this, this was my why statement. I think that I, and I think a lot of us um, are in this profession because we plant the seeds of curiosity um, in other people's brains that lead to the miracles that are abundant in our world. You know, And I, I truly believe that when people um, are, are aware of all the amazing things that this planet has to offer, that they start to care about it and they start to try and do things to, to help sustain it. So, you know, I found for me in the end, saving the world isn't about um, designing the perfect green product. Um, the seeds we plant as librarians have been scientifically proven to work, actually. Um, a 2019 University of Rochester study found that that, that feeling of awe that, that people have sometimes, um, it leads to a greater awareness of the things we don't know, which in turn makes us more likely to seek out a framework such as science um, to fill in those gaps of the things we don't understand. So I, I think that librarians help save the world by investing time in people and their community members and helping them make those connections that will strengthen community resiliency. Um, and this, this slide here is just a selection of patrons. We had a photographer um, in Arkansas named Don House. He recently, his book I think is coming out this fall, um, where he, he, he and his partner Sabina Schmidt did this project where they went around to the most remote libraries in Arkansas, some of the most small and rural libraries and took pictures of community members, pictures of the building and it's accompanied by essays about what the library means to those patrons. And what I loved about this project was I look at these people and I know each and every one of them. They are my neighbors, they are my friends and, and that's why I care about them. And that's sort of one of the things I care about the earth. And I think librarians also care about our community. And I think there's just such a great strength to that. Um, so I was further sort of emboldened to, to try and make really big changes at our library um, when the ALA put out um, this press release in May of 2019, as I'm sure you're all aware, saying that they were adding sustainability to one of their core values. 
Um, and I think it just was really fitting because I think libraries by their very nature are green and that our resources are shared by a larger community. We're not having a book that we each personally own, we share it. Um, but I think that there's more work to be done and I think the ALA recognizes this. I think libraries, they extend, they can extend um, their environmental benefits further through our operations if we really start examining our buildings um, and seek to minimize consumption of resources um, in in buildings or operations. And that's that's straight from the the ALA's statement on sustainable libraries. And so we started doing things like that. So for us at a small library and other small libraries, um, that that makes me think of the make do mindset when i first moved to arkansas i worked at a history museum in the research library um, and i was introduced to the ozark legacy of making do which was about as early settlers moved into this part of the world they had to manage with what they had because it was so remote um, and cash was scarce and stores were few and far between so when things broke they fixed them and um when they needed something new, if they needed a new tool or a household item, a lot of times they made up their own from discarded objects, such as a quilt made from scraps of worn out clothing. Um, and that that is something that I think really affects a lot of rural communities. And I think it's something that our, our nation has a legacy of. If we go back to the Great Depression and Calvin Coolidge's motto for Americans about, um, what was it? It was use it up, wear it out, make do or do without. Um, and it was it was talking about a, adopting new strategies to survive in a time of scarcity. And me personally, I saw these habits embodied in my own grandmother who lived through the depression. Um, but she continued a life of frugality and thrift throughout her life, even as I think the majority of the world moved on to um, a culture that was more of like a, a throwaway tradition. Um, when people's income started increasing and manufacturing scaled up, people saw a lot of things as this works for now, it's inexpensive, use it up when I'm done, I throw it away. Um, and that's just never how she was. And I think that going forward in the world, especially with small libraries where we don't have the biggest budgets, this is something we already know how to do and it's something we can just look for more opportunities um, to do in, in how we operate in the community. Um, I think that I saw it first working at a different library. I, I worked at the uh, um, Naropa University in Boulder, Colorado, um, in the library there. And I, I saw how we would never throw away a piece of paper that was just printed on one side. And we didn't throw away the packages that interlibrary loans came in. We reused those. And I, I think that's, that's just, because okay. libraries are under-resourced and underfunded and understaffed. But despite all that, we accomplish amazing things. Um, that sounds like the same thing. I remember when I worked at my job before here was at a university, Pace University back in, in New York. Yeah. And same thing, piles and piles of boxes and uh, for interlibrary loan. That's what I did and reuse it until it fell apart. <laughs> exactly. Because we don't necessarily have a budget to buy new things, but also there's no point to allocate funding to a budget to buy new boxes if we have a supply of perfectly usable boxes right, you know, in the corner that yeah, are arriving daily. Now when I save boxes at home that are useful. <laughs> yeah, and so I'm not to, trying to glamorize scarcity here, but I think the, the mindset, it does create a, a sustainable approach um, that's appropriate to the times we're living in. Um, there's the, if y'all have heard of permaculture, that's a, I think a lot of people have certain ideas when they think about permaculture, they think about maybe hippies and communes and things like that, but it's it's really a design framework um, to, to think about an approach to be a little bit more sustainable. And in the principles of permaculture, this mindset aligns with the principle of using edges, just finding your little opportunities where they are. So, I wanted to tell you about my library's journey here. And I will tell you that we started very, very small. And it started with 
I'm I'm currently the director of my library, but before I was the director, I was just I was a part-time um, circulation desk clerk because I really wanted to work at this library, and library jobs at the time were a little sc scarce. So I got my foot in the door, working at the circ desk. Um, and something I noticed was that we offered free coffee at the library. And again, this was way before um, ALA put out the 2019 thing. We just started on this journey with with these things. Um, we offered free coffee. We offered little mini plastic straws, I'm sure you've seen, to stir the coffee. And it was just one of those things that bothered me because I'm sure we've all seen it on social media, the videos of the turtles and they've got the the straws in their noses and how it's killing sea life. And it just was one of those things that just seemed kind of unnecessary. Um, and I was, I was a little nervous about asking about it. I didn't want to rock the boat. And I live in, you know, um, a state that for the most part, a lot of people don't prioritize things like this. Um, but I, at a staff meeting, sort of just raised my hand and I asked my director, I said, you know, I, I've looked and I've done a little research and I see that these bamboo stir sticks, they're just a little less expensive. And I was just wondering when we're done with these, can we make this change? And she said, yeah, sure, that's great. So that was our very first step of switching from plastic straws to bamboo stir sticks. And it, I was very proud of that one small step. Um, and so, it sort of started, kept going from there. One of the next things was that um, we were doing a teen program and we discovered maybe an hour before the program was supposed to happen that we'd run out of, I think, solo cups because that's normally what we serve drinks at during these programs. Um, and it was like, okay, one of us needs to run to the store. But then there was just a moment where we looked in the cabinet and realized we had tons and tons of coffee mugs. More, we have a staff of eight people here and we probably have, I don't know, 40 coffee mugs, which is just how it goes. Um, and we thought, you know, why don't we just use these mugs for this program? Um, and then we just stopped buying cups for the most part. It We just started, kept using these mugs. And one of these great things about mugs is if you've worked with teens, you know that they have the ability to spill pretty much anything. And these mugs are really heavy. They've got a handle. We've had fewer spills using um, coffee mugs to serve Kool-Aid and juice in. Um, and yet another small step. Um, I, I'm certain that a lot of you, if you ever do programs with kids, with crafts, you're, you're collecting all sorts of things to reuse. That's just part of how we operate. Um, and I had a friend who said, you know, I've got these glass yogurt wee jars. Um, I've got some of these, would you like any? And I said, oh sure, we'll find a use for those. Um, and she had a couple hundred of them and I was just, overwhelmed and surprised when she brought them to me. So I was driving around for a little bit in the back of my car for a few days. And my son, um, who I think was five at the time, looked over and he said, Mom, why are all these jars here? And I said, ah, you know, um, Jana gave them to me. I don't know what to do with them. I'm trying to figure out something to do. And he said, well, and I'm sure he he notices the way I, I work, but he had this great idea. He said, why don't you use them to serve the goldfish at Lego Club? Because um, we would always serve them in little disposable Dixie cups. And I thought, oh, that's a great idea. And so that's what we do now. No more little Dixie cups. We serve them out of these glass jars. We have so many that if someone you know, has to leave Lego Club and has to take their, they want to take their snack with them, we say, just go ahead, That we can replace that. So interesting, um, the dirtiness of them that you don't think, that it's things you wouldn't have thought about, the, the mugs and probably those glass things are they're heavier, they don't get spilled, they don't get mm -hmm. crushed or anything by the little little kids' little hands. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and it, it just kept going from there, kept more little choices here and there where we kept finding these options and if it was something we could do often, if it was less expensive or free, um, it was something we did. So, for example, if any of y'all order any items from Amazon, I know if I'm looking for an older item, we don't necessarily get our discounts through the jobber, so we will look for it on Amazon if a patron wants it. Um, mm. And we have an Amazon Prime account. You can easily get that two-day shipping, but if you choose to set up your Amazon delivery day, um, you can choose this option. It, it 
results in fewer delivery trips and your items in fewer boxes. It means that packages are delivered, like, so two-day shipping, when you click two-day shipping, it means that your items, your packages are often delivered on jets that are underloaded to prioritize getting your items to you as fast as you can. But I think as librarians, we often plan ahead and we don't necessarily need our things that quickly. It's not usually um, in our case situation. No, no, not at all. It, Exactly. So if you choose that Amazon delivery day, often those items go on to trucks, um, which means the carbon emissions for delivering a package a few days faster is substantially um, less than if they were delivered to various facilities and the sort of the shipping chain as they're normally done. Um, or if, if it's less, if it's delivered via truck versus via an underloaded airplane. Um, Another thing I found out about, and when I go to the high schools in the fall and I deliver my um, <laughs> information literacy talk to some of these high school students about doing research um, professionally and looking at peer reviewed resources, I often sometimes will just mention um, Ecosia, which is a web browser that plants trees when you search. Um, they actually get money from ad clicks, but the estimate they put out is that one tree is planted for every 45 searches. And in 2020, they planted their 100 millionth tree. It's wow. estimated, yeah, that the trees they've planted um, have removed 1,771 tons of um, CO2 every single day. So, I, I tell people about it. I've also installed the browser on the patron computers. You know, it's not the default one, but it's there. And sometimes I'll tell people if they're asking, what's this little icon here? And I, I give them a little blurb about Ecosia to, again, spread the word, let them make that choice. Um, uh, another thing we've done is we buy snacks family size. So we used to buy our chips and a lot of our goldfish, things like that, in the individual little packages that people could take with them. Um, we found that at the end of programs, we had a lot of half empty or almost full open bags of chips and we'd throw them all away. A lot of food waste, a lot of plastic waste. Um, and we started buying the family size, which is not only less expensive, it reduces the waste. We would portion it out in little reusable bowls or plates. Um, I, I say to people too, like when you start looking at your snack options, you can get bonus points if you start looking at the ingredients and purchasing things without palm oil. Um, that's a long explanation. If you don't know why palm oil isn't a great choice, I will just tell you it's in so many different things. And I, there's a further explanation of the deal about palm oil in my resource handout. Um, but it's, it's devastating <laughs> to the environment, um, the rate at which palm oil is being consumed. Um, and it's common to find that one brand versus the other, like the generic brand does not contain palm oil. Um, where is the brand name and the generic brand's going to be a little less expensive, whereas the brand name will. Um, so for example, Townhouse Crackers versus Ritz Crackers. Townhouse doesn't have palm oil, Ritz Crackers do, or Lay's Potato Chips do have it. Kettle Brand doesn't. Goldfish Crackers definitely don't have palm oil, which I was thrilled to see. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, and I'll mention, did mention your hand, um, resources handout. Um, mm -hmm on the for everyone who's sitting on the session page for today's show where you went to um, register or log in or anything um, I've already posted the um, resources handout that April provided with um, lots of information and just now uh, her slides as well are there so if you wanted to pop over to the um, session page for today you can grab those documents right now while we're doing the show okay thank you Krista um, and so that helped us work up to bigger changes. Um, some of the things we've changed so far is we've replaced um, all of our disposable paper products with um, ones that are recycled, um, which maybe requires more information. So our paper towels and our um, toilet paper, we switched to a brand called Who Gives a Crap? Um, and it's a tongue-in-cheek name, but it ended up being less expensive. Um, oh, it's telling me I have a slow network connection. I'm going to turn off my webcam for now. Sure. Okay. It um, still sound and look good from my side, but yeah, every now and then, yeah, go to webinar. We'll warn you about things like that. Yeah. 
think, yeah, um, I just, I don't want to be dropped off. It's happened before. This is, again, rural area, you know, sometimes the internet's not great. Um, but so we switched to a brand called Who Gives a Crap. It was actually less expensive than the brand we were using. And it wasn't a brand name. It was, again, we ordered in bulk. It wasn't the nicest um, TP. This this toilet paper is actually pretty nice. It ends up just costing a dollar a roll. We were paying a dollar twenty five a roll, um, and this company donates fifty percent of its profits to water sanitation and hygiene products like or projects like building toilets, um, advancing disability inclusion, and providing soap and hand washing stations in developing countries. Uh, we changed our tissues as well to a brand that uses um, recycled one. It's called Markel. Um, it was less expensive than the box tissues we were buying previously. The, the Markel brand was rated by the National Resource Defense Council scorecard, which you may have seen um, uh, as a B, the who gives a crap gets an A plus. And if you look at all the big name brands, they get really bad um, ratings. And the reason it's kind of a big deal is a lot of these big brand name toilet paper companies and, and tissue companies are using um, virgin paper pulp, it, it, which a lot of times this is sourced from virgin boreal forests in Canada that are being chopped down and they're losing both that CO2 sink, but they're also, it's fresh trees that are being turned into something that we use for just half a second and gets thrown away. So that's why that is kind of pretty important. Um, and again, even bigger changes. We, um, I, I had heard about a program well, I, I had in my own home with my own energy provider, my electric company, they came and did an audit of my house to, to tell me how I could make my house a little bit more energy efficient. And I tried to do something similar with the electric company that um, that services our library here in town because it's a, a different company and I couldn't get a hold of anyone for a long time. I think it's because we we're considered industrial, but we're very small and we just weren't a huge priority for them. But based on what I learned um, from the one done in my home, I, I did our own informal building energy assessment. And we did things like very small changes that have had a significant impact, like repairing um, the seals around the doors, we installed uh, weather stripping where our old building has shifted and I could see daylight around windows and around doors. Um, we uh, received a small grant from our library foundation and used those funds to make energy efficient improvements in our library, including the installation of solar shades because we here at my lovely, beautiful old Carnegie Library building, which is over 100 years old, have uh, single pane, century old glass windows, which are terribly energy efficient. And I, I noticed when comparing my budgets to the other libraries um, in our system that our overhead for energy costs was huge in comparison. And a lot of it was just because our, our HVAC system couldn't keep up with our leaky drafty building. So that the installation of those last year um, has helped quite a bit. We also replaced our very old refrigerator. Um, we, over a few years, were able to shift some money in our budget to replace our HVAC system. And those two are are a big deal. The, the refrigerator and the HVAC system sounds very like something that's innocuous, but um, if you read the book uh, Drawdown, which is again referenced in my notes that it talks about the most impactful ways to to adjust your carbon footprint or your organization's carbon footprint and strangely oddly enough the number one thing that people can do to make a difference is to make sure that the appliances they're running with coolant in them um the i think they're hydrofluorocarbons i might be saying that wrong fluorochlorocarbons um the <laughs> Are, are really terrible for the environment. So they can, if they can update those or if they're operating with newer, you know, um, energy efficient ones and get those older um, appliances disposed of in a <laughs> proper way. A lot of times if you order a new refrigerator, that company will take out the old one and they will properly dispose of the coolant in it. That has the biggest impact, which really surprised me, but it was something I was glad to be able to do. Um, and again, we couldn't do this all right away. This has been a very slow 
um, journey towards sustainability because we do have such a limited budget. It was just where we could do it. So, um, and I think that's something important so that, thing that, that for, for people watching this that like, oh my gosh, there's so many different things and how are we going to do it? You don't do this all at once. Mm -hmm. No, one at a time. Not right? at all. Yeah. And then move on to the yes. next, figure uh, out the first thing. Yeah. <laughs> And, and I wanted to point out too that, so this is something that's taken place over several years, but then when I looked back at our energy bills from, um, you know, after we had made all these changes versus several years before, we had saved like around $800 um, in one year as to a previous wow. years just from making these small changes, which is, it's substantial for us, you know, that's that's money that can go to buy new books or put on different programs. I, I was thrilled to find that. Um, and again, the initial investment might seem like a little bit much, you know, those solar shades, I think were a couple of thousand dollars, which thankfully enough, we were able to get a grant from, but if that helps reach that $800 a year in saving, quickly pay. Um, mm -hmm. So the, another thing we've been doing is we have a, an amazing volunteer um, who has been fixing our broken appliances. And I was surprised after stepping into my role as director to learn how many times or how often things break down. Um, we have an industrial coffee maker. We have a, a popcorn popper that's broken. Um, uh, both of our microwaves, our dehumidifier, all of these things have broken down. Um, and instead of replacing those things, we asked this volunteer if he would be willing to help us out. And, you know, oftentimes it was, I think he said one time it was a thermal fuse, it was a power switch. It was very small things, each were around $10 or less. Um, and when I added up the cost of replacing all of those things, it was over $1,000. So you might not have this person right away, but I would say you might, you might consider who you have coming to your library, or if there's, um, if there's, I'd say a lot of these skills are are harnessed by some older people, older generations, um, and start chatting them up. See if you have anyone in your community who knows how to repair things, or even if there's just a repair store that you can take your items to instead of just quickly replacing them. And, you know, as our coffee maker or industrial coffee maker was being replaced, I did bring in a smaller one from home so we could keep serving coffee in the meantime, but it wasn't it wasn't too big of a deal to um to do that in the meantime and, and get that repaired instead of replacing it. So those lead to even bigger changes. Um, I mentioned before we replaced our refrigerator with an Energy Star appliance that saved us some money. We replaced our HVAC system, um, and eventually we even replaced our um, lights, our fluorescent lights, with all LED lightings with a retrofit. Um, I would say, um, I guess I, I wanted to segue from things being fixing that not everything can be fixed. So that refrigerator we had that was literally rattling around and it sounded like a band was going around and just wasn't think, keeping things in the freezer frozen, um, it, it, we couldn't keep it. Um, so sometimes you do have to replace it with something better, but just look for those ones that you can. And sometimes those appliances will be a little bit more expensive, but it's it's definitely worth it. Um, let's see, uh, we, we ended up getting a hold of our energy company after a while. And one of the things they did offer to do was to come and do an assessment of our lighting. Um, and they, I found out they offered incentives for upgrading to more energy efficient lighting um, systems or HVACs. We had already replaced our HVAC system, so we didn't get to have um, that incentive. I wished I'd known about it or gotten them to, to call me back and I wish I'd sort of been a bit more persistent so we could have gotten that, um, that incentive, but we were able to get it with our um, LED lighting retrofit. They, the, the energy company actually paid for more than half of the change and I was able to move some of the donations we'd received to pay for the other half of that, which again for, we have three library buildings, we have our main library, we have our, um, and an annex building next door and for all three of those, it, it cost us I, around a couple of thousand dollars to replace all the lights, but we've already started seeing energy savings from that as well. 
Um, and and I'd say that it's it's worth it to keep calling the the people who who provide your energy. I would say even if they don't have these sort of programs, you can ask them if they do um, RECs, if they have a renewable energy credit program. Um, those those are where they um, purchase renewable energy credits from other electric companies that um, do have renewable energy um, <laughs> streams and and sort of it's a, it's a credit base so it's a way to support renewable energy even if it's not something that your electric company is offering um, and even if you can't afford it if you can put it in their mind when I first spoke to uh, my my energy company they hadn't heard about it but um, the person I spoke with was pretty excited and said he was going to look into it and bring it to up to his boss so again sometimes it's just spreading that information, spreading the word, and planting the ideas in people's minds. Um, so the next thing, besides, besides some of those changes, we started looking at our procedures and our operations. And, and one thing I noticed was that for whatever reason, as part of our protocols, we'd always left our computers on all the time. We'd restart them at the end of the day, like when we were closing down, but then they stayed on all night long. So my first thing was to just look around and said, you know what, we're gonna start turning them off. Um, but what was great about that, and this is gonna sound strange, was a different librarian approached me and said, listen, there's a reason we leave them on. And it's because when we get them started in the morning, you know, our ILS takes several minutes to load up and we've got patrons calling and people walking through the door wanting their stuff right then and there. I'm sure you all have people who are there maybe waiting at the library door or before you are ready. Oh, yeah. um, before you're in the door and unlocking the door, ready to to get what they need. And she said, and it just slows things down and that's why we keep it up. We keep them on because it just, everything takes so long to start up. And so it was it was great to think about that. And we I worked with her and we came up with a different solution, which was to adjust the energy settings on our computers so that they go to sleep a little bit more quickly. But that also means they can wake up more quickly than if you're just starting them um, from scratch. So it, like our main patron computers, we shut those down, but our operating computers, our circ desk computers, we have them go to sleep after they haven't been used for about 15 minutes because waking up from sleep mode versus restarting them is, is a much more um, rapid process, but it also enables us to save some more energy when they're not in use. Um, so then we also started doing a laundry rotation and this happened again before I was director. Um, my director at the time brought up to us that she'd noticed that our paper towel bill had um, gotten really high. You know, we were just ordering a lot and going through them very quickly and that's definitely not a sustainable thing to do. Um, and this was before we switched to a recycled, cheap, less expensive brand. I shouldn't say cheaper, less expensive. Um, but it made me think of something I'd, I'd done at a different place. When I worked at that history museum, um, everyone rotated doing the laundry. If you had to do a Saturday shift, which we all did one every three or four months, one of our duties was to take home the historical costumes that were in the exhibit hall and just give them a wash, bring them home, hang them back up on the pegs. And so when she said that, like we're going through a lot of paper towels, which I should say it was probably partially my fault. We started doing um, cooking programs with the teenagers here. And again, lots of spills, lots of stuff to pick up. Um, uh -huh. I, I, I thought back to that and I said, well, what if we do a laundry rotation? I'm not saying completely re replace the paper towels, but you know, if something spilled, it's going to take, you know, a lot of paper towels versus one kitchen towel. Um, but I know we don't have the facilities to have a washing machine here. And I said, but this was something we did here. And if it was just by volunteer, how many people could we get able to volunteer? And, you know, because it was optional, I think that was a good approach we had. Um, some people opted not to be part of the laundry rotation, but we had at least six uh, staff members who were willing to, to step in and be part of a weekly laundry rotation. And it was set up such that we don't go through just tons of towels and aprons, you know, um, that quickly. So we set the, the window of opportunity for someone's turn to be two weeks. 
And I think I, I end up only having a turn every once, every three months. So it's not that big of a burden, but it does make a huge difference on our bottom line for costs and just our, um, our waste and our impact in general. Um, uh, another thing we did was it looked at the the discs, <laughs> looked in at CDs and DVDs. So thankfully, I'm very grateful. In our town, we do have recycling, but it's pretty basic. Um, our, we They accept paper, cardboard, metal, glass, um, and for plastics, only ones and twos, which is, uh, what do you call it, PET and or HDPE, but only in bottle forms. It has to be in bottle form for whatever reason. And that leaves a lot of items that could be thrown away. So one of the things we've done in an attempt to reduce our waste is we've looked into specialty recycling for a few different things. Um, so one of the things we ended up throwing a lot out of was scratched DVDs and CDs. So for Earth Day in 2019, we offered a promotional program to collect these from patrons who had these that they needed to dispose of. Um, and, and also just, you see Christmas lights in that picture. They also collect Christmas lights. Um, and as part of that program, we were also accepting dried out markers um, because we were going through a lot of those and we found a lot in our programming closet um, and we had read that Crayola accepts these, um, any, any brand name of dried out markers. So we started collecting these. Right. We were able to yep, ship our that. scratch. Yeah. yeah. So we, we shipped our scratched CDs to the CD Recycling Center of America, which I will say I've checked on recently is temporarily closed because of COVID. Um, but I started doing preliminary research and I found a different place that collects them as well. Um, but so if you have any of those, you might just sit on them a little bit while longer and keep checking back and you can sign up for their um, email when they get operations going again, they're going to email people to let them know that they are accepting scratch discs again. Um, but so when I tried to go to recycle the Crayola ones, I found that you had to be a school teacher. Um, so I contacted our local high school art teacher and I found out she was actually already collecting them for the school. And, but through that connection, this teacher and I, the art, art teacher at the high school, we're now coordinating with our community center um, with the school representing the school and the library and the community center to try and form drop-off stations for various recycled goods in our community. Um, there's other items. If you look at the company TerraCycle, they collect all sorts of difficult to recycle items. Um, and even thinking back to plastic, there's the number fives are really hard to recycle in most municipal recycling programs. <laughs> and the Gimme Five project will collect um, your number fives. That's polypropylene. Um, that's yogurt, you know, traditional yogurt jars, all sorts of stuff. And they make them into toothbrushes and razor handles. Um, so there's just all sorts of options there. TerraCycle is linked in the resource handout. Um, and I think it's important to point out too that we are lucky in that we can use reusable dishes. Um, and again, I after we started using the mugs, then we got plates and we got silverware and we've been doing that and we've built in time at the end of our programming to to wash up and we sort of get our teens to come and help us do some dishes because I think that's sort of an important thing to pass along as well is, you know, we ate off this, now we're going to clean it. And usually we always have a teen who's really excited to help and volunteer. So we're lucky for that. But we are lucky just to have a sink. I know a lot of rural and small libraries don't necessarily have those facilities. Um, so if you end up having to stick with those solo cups, definitely check out TerraCycle because they have a solo cup recycling program. Um, so this is a lot of changes, obviously. And I think that it's sometimes when you're working with people and you've always done things kind of the same way, it it's daunting to try and change things. I know that firsthand. It's kind of scary to to say, okay, we've done it this way, but we're gonna do it this way. And it's it's not that these things are going to be easier. You know, when we wash up after a program, if all the kids have to go and the program ran long, then you are washing the dishes. And it would be a lot easier to just throw, <laughs> throw away those plastic utensils, um, throw away things 
and so I wanted to point out that I'm not saying that all of this is just so much easier, but I have found a very effective way to communicate with uh, my coworkers and staff about these changes um, is quoting Harry Potter. Um, and because I think a lot of people love Harry Potter and, and talking about Albus Dumbledore and his quote that dark and difficult times lie ahead and soon we must all face the choice between what is right and what is easy. What is easy is to use those disposables and throw them away as though we don't have to worry about them tomorrow, but we do. Mm -hmm. And the right thing to do is to try and care and try and think about a better, more sustainable way to do things. So I would definitely recommend and um, leaning on the wisdom of Albus Dumbledore um, when you're trying to talk about making changes to um, your staff members and coworkers. Um, and also, again, all of these small changes, as, as Krista mentioned earlier, it was slow, it was small, it was progress. We did not do all of this all at once. And it's easy to make a change and then look at all the things you haven't changed and to see all of your waste and get discouraged. Um, and it's it's not a great feeling, but I, I like this idea of thinking about, you know, this, this lady did this quote about um, Anne-Marie Bonneau about zero waste. Um, and I, I think rather thinking about that, another way of looking at it is we need millions of people and businesses and organizations doing sustainability imperfectly and starting their journeys. And I, I think that libraries are really positioned to help lead the way because we are trusted organizations in our community. Um, I think we are just well positioned to be leaders for other organizations and businesses. And as I said, we've started coordinating with other organizations and other nonprofits in our area, and they start to get interested in what we're doing and saying like, oh, I, I see you're, you've, you're doing things a little bit differently. And I said, yeah, you know, it's been slow. It's something we're doing, um, but I think it makes a big impact. And I think that, um, for me, it's really important because one of the reasons I do do these things, I, I love programming. That's that's one of my loves as a librarian and working with people and helping serve the community, especially kids. I love doing story time. Um, and I think it's one of those ways that it sends a subtle message to our youngest patrons that we care about them, but we care about them in like the deepest level and about their future here in our community and, and what their lives are going to be like. Um, so I think it's it's also, it's actions speak louder than words and that's a big part of it. Um, so <laughs> talking about programming, we also um, started looking about offering more educational programs on sustainability and ecology and community resilience. And a part of that is we had um, some representatives from the lo local native plant project, um, and they have these these native plant organizations and groups worldwide. And I put a link into where you can find your local chapter of it, um, and invited them to come talk about why native plants are so important. Um, a lot of people, myself included, um, love ornamental plants. You know, I love my hydrangeas, and I didn't know this, but they originally came from Asia. There's all these lovely plants that the bugs just won't really mess with because they haven't evolved to eat them. They haven't evolved to lay their eggs on them um, with caterpillars and things um, um, consuming them. But they're so important because regardless of your feeling about insects, a lot of people really like birds. A lot of people like frogs. You like your bigger, furry, um, more glamorous creatures. <laughs> oh. Oh, April, it looks like we might have lost your sound or lost. Oh, she just went offline. Oh, as she was worried that she might get bumped <laughs> potentially due to her internet connection. That's that's okay. Um, <clears throat> we will wait for her to come back. Sorry about that. As she mentioned, the uh, risk of being you know, 
the things you'd have to deal with working being in a room um rural area and rural library looks like she lost her internet connection that's okay she should be able to get logged it back in so we'll uh, wait for her um while she's doing that i'll just uh, remind everyone too in case you didn't weren't here earlier didn't hear um the resources she's been talking about the handout is available on the session page for today's show you can go there and grab that right now as a pdf it is available um, with all of her links to all of the different uh programs and and resources she's been talking about and um her slides as well that's the other thing i was gonna say her slides are also available there um as a PDF if you want to have them as, as a reference or a resource as well. Wait and see if she gets reconnected. I'm keeping an eye on it. Uh, if anybody has any questions, comments, or thoughts, anything, um, you can type into the questions section of our, your GoToWebinar interface. Uh, you can go ahead and do that at any time and I can uh, pass them on to her to answer when she gets back connected again. Or if you have anything that you've done in these ways at your libraries, um, any of the things that she's mentioning or any any ideas you have for people uh, who what they can do to for sustainability, for um, saving energy, uh, any thoughts or ideas, go ahead and type into your questions, the question section, and I can share that with everyone. Keeping an eye on it. Hopefully she'll get back in here. <laughs> I'm watching to see if she comes through. I will actually, I'm going to do this here. I'm going to pull while we're waiting for people to get reconnected. I am going to, if you can always get that back up again here. Um, this is the page for today's show. Um, and I'll share the link uh, into the questions as well um just watching to see if she comes this big next you're gonna want to miss it <laughs> yeah, open this up here yeah there we go. um so um this is off of our main encompass live page right now the show because it's still happening but um, this is a specific page. We're going to link to her presentation slides here and resource links handout here, um, which she keeps talking about the resources that she's provided. Um, you can click on that and it opens it up into our um, slide share that we use. And you can see here all the links. This is something you can download and save uh, for yourself. And you have all these links to all the different resources that April has been discussing this morning. And she did have, uh, I was actually gonna mention, someone did actually ask about seed libraries. Um, that was on that most recent sl that slide that we were just looking at there um, before April lost her connection. Okay, she's finally back. Just gonna, hopefully she'll be coming back soon. Um, and the question we have, um, as far as seed libraries go, how can you make sure you're not introducing an invasive species? Uh, that's a good question since considering she was talking about issues with um, is you know, trying to do more local things. Um, I would, I'm sure when she comes back, she may have some thoughts on this, but I would recommend checking in with your local, um, maybe a master gardener program uh, here through, in Nebraska through the Nebraska Extension offices. They will talk to you about anything going on. Um, you know, agricultural wise and can help you with um, figuring those things out. Um, so check with some something like that and see, um, you know, in, 
your university or master gardeners to see what is what should I be growing, what should we be sharing. Um, and I know we do have here in Nebraska multiple libraries that are doing seed libraries. We've had quite a few of them on Encompass Live in the past. Uh, so if you wanted to hear more about that specific project or program, you can do a search in our archives for seed or seeds, and you should be able to, um, you can watch any of our recordings. Um, waiting for April to get reconnected again. I'm sure she's realizing that she lost her connection. We'll see if And what I will do now, while we're waiting for that too, I will show you here, um, so I did mention this, I was gonna do this at the end of the show, but I'll do it right now while we are uh, waiting for people to get back with us. Um, this is our main Encompass Live page, and our archive links are right here. These are upcoming shows. Feel free to please do register for any of those if you're interested in any of our topics we have coming up. But the archive link is right here underneath, so you can click there. And this will be all of our archives. Today's show uh, will be at the top of the list. Most recent one is first. And it will have a link to what was already in there. It's the same session page here will be used. So you have a link to the presentation and the handouts. And there'll be another um, link that will be added here that will be to watch the recording. And everyone who attended today and registered for today's show will get an email from me letting you know when the recording is available so you can go here and access it. And I'll also mention while we're here, um, you can, and this is where you can do search. And I'm gonna do a search here, let's see, seed, let's see. There we go, seed saving for libraries, engaging your community and feeding America, garden seeds exchange, summer meals and more. There's April is back. I'm gonna pop you back over again to panelist April. All right, hello, you're back. April, you are unmuted. You should be able to talk. I'm not hearing anything just yet, though. All right. I'm so sorry about that. That's connected okay. anymore, and so I'm not sure where I got lost or where can where I stopped um, transmitting. Sure, I can. I can. Um, I can give you presenter control back. We were just talking about. You see, I'm sharing my slides here because oh, I was. Um, people were asking about seed libraries because that was up on the screen when you had your slides up at last, and I was just showing here in our archive. Perfect. A few previous shows. Um, Discuss seed libraries um, and seed exchanges um, that people can watch. And I'll just mention while Perfect. I am around the archives so that you know, um, this is our full archives for Encompass Live too. Um, you can see, you can search all the whole archives, which is what I did, but you can just search the most recent 12 months if you want something really current. Um, that's because this is our full show archives and I'm not gonna scroll all the way down, but um, to when we first started broadcasting the show, which was, um, we premiered in January 2009. Um, so there's a lot of shows here. <laughs> um, but just pay attention to the original broadcast date of anything when you are looking at our archives um, to know when it actually first went out. Um, some of the shows may stand the test of time. Um, reading lists, certain things, uh, but some things may become old and outdated. Uh, resources might have changed drastically. Some things might not exist anymore. Links might be broken. You never know. So um, just pay attention to that when you are watching um, any of the archives from our show. So April, I'm, I'm going to give you presenter control again so you can get your slides back up. You should see that pop up again. Okay. It's going to make me go. The one that has about the seed libraries. Okay. All right. Um, and you hadn't gotten to that part of it yet, though. Um, oh, I hadn't gotten to it? Well. No, you were talking about the plants and hydrangeas and. Oh, okay. Um, man, oh, I've been talking for a while to myself. I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, no let's see. I. I was talking about native plants and why they're important to ecology. Um, yes. Well, uh, I'll, I'll try to summarize really quick and basically say that regardless of your feelings about insects, um, these native plants are um, super important for 
the uh, your local ecology so even the more furry glamorous animals like rabbits and foxes depend on those native plants because it's part of their important food chain um, and a lot of them are getting displaced by um, ornamentals that are imported from Asia because they're so hardy and the insects won't attack them but those insects attacking some of the native plants are incredibly necessary for pollinators but also just for for insects to lay their eggs and so that their um their babies can be food for bigger animals um the next thing I was talking about was the Climate Reality Project. Uh, we had a climate reality leader who was a professor from the University of Arkansas come and give a talk about the hard science behind climate change um, and the effects specifically on our region and what we can expect in the coming decades. But, you know, it wasn't all doom and gloom. She also talked about the solutions for how people can work to mitigate these changes through their own actions. Um, there are presenters from this group that are located all over the country. Um, there's a link to how you can find them and request a presentation at your library. Um, they're happy to come and give that presentation. They just want to share information and they tailor the information to your area so people can make connections with how climate change will affect them living wherever they're at. Um, the next thing I talked about was we started a seed library and it sounds like something you, you spoke of. I, I feel like we premiered mm -hmm. ours just in time in February of 2020 is when we started to oh, offer yeah. it. Yeah, and, and that's right when seed suppliers started experiencing shortages during the pandemic. Um, everyone mm -hmm. was at home planting a garden. They were concerned about food security, but also they had a lot of time on their hands and they couldn't get seeds from those seed catalogs. So mm -hmm. we were able to provide our patrons with seeds um, through our seed library. We put them out on our curbside pickup tables and we mailed them. Um, I said that ideally that seed libraries are self-sustaining resources because participants who check out seeds um, or borrow seeds, return them when they um, harvest seeds from the things that they grow. But that doesn't always work and you sometimes need to replenish them. Um, and a lot of seed companies will actually offer donations to help libraries get started. I, I recommend, and I think I linked to it in my resource page, checking out the Kent District Library's seed library website. Uh, they have a wonderful page full of resources, ideas, seed companies that might donate to help you get started um, at your library. Uh, and um, we do have a question about the seed libraries that did come in um, while you were off. Um, so let's know, as far as seed libraries go, how can you make sure you're not introducing an invasive species? Um, so we order from specific companies. We order from, um, and, and that's the thing too, if, if patrons just say like, oh, this is growing in my garden and I brought it in and here you go, we do some research uh, mm -hmm. before we offer them out there. So a lot of our seeds we get from Baker Creek, which only does like heirloom uh, plants and um, vegetables and fruits. Um, and then we order a lot from our local native plant uh, seed distribution, which is out of southern Missouri, actually, is because I'm in very northern Arkansas, um, to get natives. And that's that's what we offer. We don't often take seeds that people have just harvested from their own garden because, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So when we do lend seeds or we give people seeds, we have a form um, and we keep track of what they've borrowed and what they're bringing back. And we say, please, like, please, if you can, if you're able to grow this successfully, harvest some seeds, bring them back because you often get a mm -hmm. lot more seeds coming back. Um, and that's just a, an easier way to avoid um, invasive species. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and I did mention too, um, to help answer the question of um, checking in with your um, local extension office or master gardeners, if you're wondering, they would know the kind of things um, that uh, should and shouldn't be grown in your area as the experts in your area. Definitely yeah. look to local people. Yes, that they're great resources. We've worked with our master gardeners as well for, for programs as, in addition to the native plant project folks. And it's and of course using your old card catalogs are the perfect. <laughs> this is picture shows. Yeah. They're so pretty. You don't have to. Some people do it in a binder and that's very efficient as well. It's just a, a binder with with um I think those little laminated sleeves for baseball cards. Um but we just happen to have one of these. perfectly in there, wouldn't they? Yes. <laughs> All right, so, oh goodness. All right, so the next thing I was talking about was uh, other programs. So we do a lot of vegetarian cooking programs. We don't necessarily market it as vegetarian cooking. We do a lot of cooking with teens. 
Um, and it, it sort of is that sustainable edge that we take advantage of. Uh, I'd say besides the, the fact that there's kind of a, an ick, ick factor of dealing with raw meat being handled by teenagers, um, it's a great opportunity to introduce um, young people to easy and tasty um, plant-based dishes. Um, and I think it's important because according to the research, um, studies show that methane, which is the gas produced by cow burps, is 84% more potent than CO2, and it's thus much more devastating in its impact on the climate. Um, the Special Report on Climate Change and Land by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change describes plant-based diets as a major opportunity for mitigating and adapting to climate change, but our experience here is that people just don't know that much about it. Um, a lot of what they're doing at home and a lot of the traditions for cooking that's been passed down to people, including myself, involve a lot of meat. So this is just a way to educate and show people how easy it is and how tasty it can be. Um, and there's resources, I believe, in my handout about some websites you can go to to find um, vegetarian uh, vegetarian options and, and meal plans. Um, another thing we do, and this is the, one of the easiest programs I've ever done, is our Slow Stitch Club. So there's this national movement called the Slow Stitch Movement, um, it, which includes visibly mending damaged clothes. And it's all about fighting the fast fashion industry, which, um, according to the organization Seven Billion for Seven Seas, is second only to oil as the world's largest polluter. The fast fashion industry emits 1.2 billion tons of CO2 equivalent per year, which is about 5% of global emissions, and that's more than those created by air travel and international shipping combined. So our, our Slow Stitch Club, um, we meet out in the garden during the winter months we met virtually. It's open to menders, knitters, quilters, crochet artists, etc. Anyone doing sort of needle or fiber arts. And it's it's really intended to bring people together safely to help foster that community um, and some creativity and mindfulness all at once. So I think there's a lot of good factors um, for doing a slow stitch club. If nothing else, it, it helps people give them that time and that space to work on something with their hands. Um, and then repair cafes. We haven't had our repair cafe yet. We had planned to do one in the spring of 2020. But it has been postponed um, mm -hmm. for uh, reasons that we have not been able to really able to safely come together in a space with a lot of power and one-on-one. -on -one. But repair cafes are something that a lot of libraries have started doing. Um, it's where you have these repair expert coaches and people bring in broken items like bicycles or sometimes things that need a zipper repaired or appliances. And I had recruited some volunteers who are expert coaches at each of those. And it's about sharing that knowledge of how to repair and mend items with other people. Um, during COVID times, if you're looking for alternatives to do a repair cafe, there's a really great website listed in the resource list called Repair Cafe, and they're doing Repair Cafe TV, um, which oh. kind of like what you have here where you have all these um, past documented webinars, they top, um, focus on a certain type of item and how to repair it, and they've aired it and saved it. So you can share those with your community, with your patrons, if they're looking to fix something um, and need advice or, or just would like to know how it's done and how people approach it. Um, and I think a big part of sustainability is comes in the form of community partnerships. Again, we share our resources, we share our audiences, and we have a greater impact and can help act as a leader on sustainability when we work together. Um, and so for us, that came in the form of first, Book delivery. Um, I don't know about y'all, but we live in this rural area and we have had people request us to deliver books, um, which was not something we were able to do before just because of a lack of resources and protocols. Um, but we learned that the local Methodist church was delivering meals to free for anyone in um, Western Carroll County, which is the county we are located in, um, regardless of the need. It wasn't, they didn't have to say, oh, I they didn't have to justify why they needed free meals. It was during the pandemic, people wanted to make sure that no one was getting forgotten or left behind as um, you know, people's wages were suddenly 
not necessarily coming in and, and people were quarantining so they couldn't get out. So when I, I heard about that and I, I thought about, I've worked with a Methodist church before I, I came in and did a program for a different group for them. I, I reached back out to my contact there um, and asked if their core of volunteers would be willing to donate books as well. And I, I found out that the answer was yes, because they had they had volunteers who wanted to deliver more food, but were only doing a few meals and so wanted to have a greater impact. Um, and for me, this meant fewer cars driving around town, delivering food and library materials um, to those who needed to stay home. So it was a win-win situation. Um, several mm -hmm. years ago, we asked if we could do a story time program at the summer farmer's market. Um, and again, they said, yes, we'd love to have you. It sort of helps create a family atmosphere at the farmer's market. And it's been a wonderfully successful collaboration. It's resulted in us having a tent um, where we could have a pop-up used book sale. Also, while we were doing our story time, we could promote library programming. We've signed people up for cards um, and summer reading. And we often do a craft as well. But I would just say, be forewarned if you get really involved and suddenly you will find yourself like me, <laughs> asked to join the board of the farmer's market. But I did, and it was, again, <laughs> a very successful experience. But just the more you get involved, the more people want, want to get you involved. So it's, yes. yeah. <laughs> Um, we also, we started our a collaboration with our community center. The first thing we did was a thing called the Lights On After School Rally. I know some other libraries um, sometimes participate in that just because a lot of libraries offer after school programs. Um, so we did something with them and had this wonderfully huge event for the community. And it's just our, our partnership has grown from there. Uh, most recently, we participated in earlier this year, a great big outdoor Earth Day celebration, um, allowing us to place, uh, they've also <laughs> allowed us to place um, an auxiliary book return drop at the community center because our library is a little bit outside of town and we often, or it's in a, a hard to get to part of town for some people, so they say. And we've heard, well, I just haven't gone by that part of town. That's why my books are late. So this new Dropbox is a, a much more convenient location right off the highway um, that allows people to return items there. And we have volunteers um, bring items from that return box to us. So it's just been uh, a really good partnership. We also did some outreach with their summer after or their summer school program. They had a summer camp and the library came and brought books and and we did some crafts. So a lot of these partnerships just gives us edges to other organizational um, oh other organizations, audiences and and just lets us share resources. Um, Don't so, have to do it all on your own. It's true. Um, and there's I was going to say another really wonderful resource that I would encourage you to take a look at is, um, and it's got ideas for partnerships and programs. It can be found in the American Library Association's Public Programming Office's Resilient Communities, Libraries, Respond to Climate Change, uh, Free Programming Guide. Um, again, see that in the resource guide for LINK. I was one of the project advisors who ended up working on that, and I really wanted to represent rural and smaller libraries to make sure that um, those the realities we face are addressed in, in that programming guide. But I'm just very proud of, of what we created. It was uh, myself, another public librarian, and two academic librarians. And there's all sorts of wonderful programs, and again, project ideas in there there's stuff on mindfulness there's just please check it out it's it's a great resource but it's a whole other thing so there's a link to it in my handout um let's see oh man was that my last slide i went through it pretty quickly i think uh, i'm usually i feel like i'm i'm still talking much later but but again i just sort of want to wrap up with um with the fact that I encourage everyone to get started on a journey and to start small so that they don't get um, overwhelmed. There's a, a concept from the book of A Field Guide to Climate Anxiety by Sarah Jaquette Ray. Um, this concept of pseudo inefficacies, this idea that these small things, these small changes don't have any impact. Um, and it's it's a very big part of climate change, about sustainability, about the, the impact it has on you mentally. Um, that 
again, that you just don't feel like this is doing any good and it can sort of lead to you just giving up and stopping any efforts. And I just want to tell everyone to not be discouraged by the idea that you're not doing everything right. Or if someone does come up and tell you that individual actions make no difference, because first of all, individual actions do add up. We have seen that, that history has shown it. Um, and furthermore, these aren't individual actions you're taking at your library. These actions are on a bigger scale because they're at an organization and they affect your whole community and your community sees what you're doing. You're not only buying more sustainable toilet paper, um, more people are being exposed to these actions. And that ripple effect has, I'd say, limitless potential. Um, so what I've given you here and talked about is sort of like a hodgepodge approach to sustainability. But if you are a more organized person <laughs> and you want a more formal approach or you want to make it part of your uh, long-term goals at your library, I'd recommend the book Ecology, Economy, Equity, The Path to a Carbon Neutral Library by Mandy Hank. Um, it has a sustainability assessment worksheet in it that can help you create your own plan. You can also check out the American Library Association's uh, editions, uh, Sustainability in Libraries, or yeah, Sustainability and Libraries. Um, that's coming out this fall and there's a link to it. I was lucky enough to get to um, contribute a chapter and I, I sort of tried to reorganize how we approach sustainability and I looked at it from the framework of uh, permaculture design um, and just all those principles and how you can use those to approach and look at your library operations to do things more sustainably. Um, and again, it's, it's much more formal. It's a little bit more organized than what I've said here. I just, I need, think it's important that everyone recognize that progress isn't linear um, and you got to celebrate every step you take in your path towards sustainability and know that you are planting the seeds for a better future. Absolutely. And that's what I got. I wholeheartedly. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, someone just want to know if you could repeat that, well, I don't know, which, the last book title, maybe? I don't, I don't want someone to repeat that book title again. <laughs> Okay. Um, are these also I, in your handout or? Yes, all of the books I've mentioned are the last thing listed on the last page of all the, the handout. I, I think I included okay. every title and and the author. Right, okay, so yeah, so here I pulled up back of the presenter control of my screen here. And they, on the resources, links handout here that you'll get. Um, did, did you scroll down here? There we go. There are all the books that she was talking about. Um, so I'm not sure which one of these you're asking about, Megan, but the, yeah, there. And so you all will have a link to this uh, when, well, it's out there right now. You can go to the session page. Um, but when the recording is done, I'll email everyone who attended today and registered today, and it will include the link directly to the recording uh, page that will have a link to this handout, too. <laughs> along with the presentations already there. And then as I mentioned earlier, the uh, link to the recording. Um, so thank you so much, uh, April. This was this was awesome. Um, so many things that you know you think about doing, and I think it's good of the, the, of libraries, what you were just talking about at the end there, um, demonstrating and that this is something that can be done. Look, we're doing it. And then yes, the community sees it happening, people coming in and may do it in their own businesses or places where they do or at home. Um, and just kind of a, a subtle under in you know backdoor way of spreading the word. <laughs> um, you can have the sessions that you know the the um, you know programming of talking about how to do all this, but also just you know having that recyclable that recyclable toilet paper in the bathroom. Someone's going to see that and say, oh, I could buy that. <laughs> We have literally had someone say that, saying like, I saw that you used this and I went and looked it up and I found it and now I've got it. And I think, great, that's exactly what I was hoping that would happen. Um, yeah, and you know, again, I, I know this time that we are living in is very divisive and there's a lot of people with a lot of different feelings about things. And unfortunately, sometimes the idea of climate change and therefore because it's linked to sustainability becomes politicized. And we definitely live um, in a, a very conservative state. And so that sometimes mm -hmm. is questioned by people. Um, and often I find that what I talk about is a focus on kids. And I say, you know, this isn't 
for us, this isn't about politics. This is about, you know, our community. And, and when you bring the focus back to the community and to children, how we're just trying to do things that we think is best for mm -hmm. them. Um, and again, don't focus on, on pundits or any of that. I think we usually connect with people over that. That farmer's market I go to, there is a lot of very conservative farmers, but you know what? We have so much in common over the fact that we care about um, plants and we care about nature. And so that's where I'm always looking for common ground to, to connect with people. And make that um, personal connection with them, yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say one other thing, because I've had this question before. Some people say, okay, what about staff members who were very resistant? And another thing that I found that's really useful is involving people, involving people on all levels of library operations um, to help mm -hmm. come up ideas for these changes. Because again, when we started using reusable cups, we, we did have some people saying, I don't wanna do this. Like, I don't wanna have to do dishes. And I said, okay, well, let's think about what we can do. Let's, let's like, please, you help me. I understand that is not very fun. So she, um, the, the lady in question did some research. She found a countertop uh, dishwasher Mm -hmm. That could help us do dishes a lot quickly. It, it more quickly. It wasn't too expensive. We got it from Walmart. Um, we set aside again certain donations. Asked for people to help us get this. And she also found um, there was some. We do coffee cups. We do some disposable, recycled paper coffee cups and compostable lids because we had styrofoam cups before, which is awful for other reasons. Um, and it, it was a good thing because she got involved. It it helped get her buy-in on the concept because she was part of creating it but it also gave us i think um multiple avenues so if something happens and we run out of which has never happened but if we do run out of um reusable cups or during the pandemic things happen people were concerned about uh hygiene we had these compostable cups and lids as an option that people can take and and it was still maybe a, a sanitary hygienic option, but it was still a better option than the styrofoam cups. Right. So it's good to have multiple avenues towards success in case something fails. And, and it, there it is, helps. it's not just the one way to do it. And there's gonna be other things that may work for you in your library. I mean, you might not have a stash of, you know, 40, coffee mugs like <laughs> April's does um, but you know figure out what you do have <laughs> mm -hmm. um, or what you can at, get uh, as for donations I know I have at home personally way too many coffee mugs that I know I don't and will never use exactly. I would be willing to donate them to the library if they had some purpose for them of course <laughs> That's exactly right and I think we've kind of come to be known in our community as as a place where people if they have something that they think is useful and they don't want to throw out they'll ask us first and we don't always say yes but there's a lot of things we have been able to use and i think that's i mean beyond sustainability i think that's just true of libraries anyway we we did we're doing take and make kits for some of our craft programs again last year um when people were really concerned and we the library was completely shut down and closed to the public and i remember we oh what were we doing we were making these ornaments out of bird seed to hang in trees um mm. for a christmas program and we needed to be able to send home a small amount of corn syrup <laughs> to for for this craft and it was like okay well how do we partition this out and i remembered i was like someone donated a bunch of bottles a little sealed bottles i think from their prescriptions but they they sealed completely and we went and pulled those out of the closet and that's how we were able to distribute like two tablespoons worth of <laughs> corn syrup to you know a couple dozen children in a in a kit yeah you never know what you can use mm -hmm. absolutely all right um okay i think i've i just like anybody had any other questions i did encourage people to, to ask questions and they did ask about the book title and the seed library um you guys can always reach you all can always reach out to april if you want to at her library for more information um look at the slides uh, look at the handouts got so many so many resources there um, that you can use so thank you everybody for attending this morning thank you for sharing this with us today april this is some great information great resources and i'm glad to have it out there for everybody thank you for having me
Yeah, um, the recording for today, I showed you all earlier how to access our archives. Uh, should be ready by the end of the day tomorrow, as long as uh, GoToWebinar and YouTube cooperate with me. Uh, everybody will get an email from me letting me, you know when it's available. Uh, someone did ask about receiving a certificate of attendance or confirmation of attending today. Uh, our GoToWebinar system will automatically generate an email to everyone who attended today's show live, and it will say, you, so if you need some sort of confirmation for earning your continuing education credits or whatever for attending, it will say this email is sent from the system to anyone who attended live this particular session. Um, and there is an attached PDF certificate if you want something you know, certificate-like to print out rather than just the email. So everybody will get that email automatically sent to them from um, today's session, everybody who attended live. We also do have a Facebook page for Encompass Live. If you'd like to use Facebook, give us a like over there. We send reminders out. Here's a reminder to log into today's show. We promote about our speakers. We post when the recording is ready. So definitely, if you like to use Facebook, you can do that. Uh, we also use the hashtag Encump Live on other social media, Twitter and Instagram. Uh, so if you want to look for that there, that's where we add, um, talk about everything that we're doing as well, promote um, the show. So that will wrap it up for today's show. Next week, we actually have something that is kind of a lead off of this one. Um, we were talking about, you talked mentioned April doing grants to do some of the work. Uh, next week's show, you can sign up for any of our upcoming shows, but next week's is about the Kreutz Bennett Donor Advice Fund. This is a grant specifically here in Nebraska for our small and rural libraries. Uh, you need a population served or 3,000 or less. And um, this is for things that you can do to repair, renovate, um, update your facility. So if you're looking to get some of those, uh, with the LED lights, LED lights, or anything in sort of construction work done on your building that you might um, need want, want to do to upgrade or update anything, um, this is a grant you could definitely apply for. So if you're in Nebraska, this is specifically just for Nebraska libraries. Uh, sign up for next week's show, learn all about the grant. Um, I will uh, warn you, this is probably the last time this grant will be available. It was a limited amount of money that was available and there's been so much given out where they're almost done. They've almost um, given away all of the funding um, that was in this program. So uh, it's been such a success. So this is the um, most likely be the last year to do it. So if you're a small library in Nebraska, this is your year to um, apply for a Kreutz Bennett uh, grant. Uh, so please do join us for that or any of our other upcoming shows. I've got August dates. You can see I'm filling in September and October. So keep an eye on our calendar as we get more um, sessions confirmed. You'll see the dates fill in here. Um, and you'll notice here we have one week of the year that we do not do in Compass Live. It's the week of our annual Library Association Conference. So for the Nebraska Library Association, Co Association Conference, it's being held uh, the week of October 13th. We will be off that week <coughs> because everybody will be attending conference. <clears throat> our conference is having, as you can see here, a mixture of virtual and in-person days. So if you're a Nebraska library, go ahead and get registered for that. Other than that, we'll see you on a future episode of Encompass Live. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we do have an, oh, someone says, thank you, thank you. Great session and lots of wonderful resources, April. <laughs> All right, so uh, thank you, everybody. And we'll see you next time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye.